Hello and welcome to episode 22 of Late Night Linux Extra. I'm Joe and this is another recording from a community meetup. This is probably one of the most heated debates that we've had. This could have gone on for hours and hours if I'd let it. It actually went on beyond the recording to some extent. You'll see why. I didn't really get a word in. I started the conversation off and then just pretty much sat back and listened. But before we get to that, a quick thank you to everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really do appreciate that. You can learn more about that at latenightlinux.com slash support. And remember, for $5 or more per month, you can get an advert-free RSS feed. And I think we're pretty much settled into the every two weeks on a Friday at 10 p.m. routine now for these meetups. So check latenightlinux.com slash mumble for details of how to join and when the next one's going to be. So let's get on with the question that I had for the group then. So I wanted to ask you all, what lengths do you go to to protect your privacy or privacy, depending on how you say it? A few years ago, I got really down the rabbit hole of privacytools.io, Prism Break, the Snowden leaks, and like started to try and de-Google and do all of this stuff. And I settled somewhere. Like I have Firefox installed and I do loads of about config tweaks. I don't save any cookies. I have the recommended extensions that they've installed, but I don't have no script. And I do install Chrome and I have an Android phone with G apps installed. And I've kind of landed in the middle because after a while I was like, like with my email, for example, I was like, I'm emailing this email to someone who uses Gmail and I'm not using any kind of encryption or anything. And so I've landed in the middle, but there were literally like three or four years ago, I was thinking about it all the time about how to like really not do anything and like try and minimize my footprint. And then I was, after a while, I just became a bit more pragmatic about it. I think this is an element of uh, applied pragmatism. You've got to, you've got to think about what is actually going to be practical in terms of minimizing the footprint that you leave on the internet as much as possible so uh, you know in terms of the plugins that you can get for firefox uh, ublock origins already been mentioned but cookie auto delete and there's a whole load of other bits and pieces that you can get your hands on that will probably improve or make that footprint smaller but you can overdo it you can take it to that point where you make sites non-functional so it's knowing when to stop i even sort of used to monitor the internet in out you know with uh, something like wireshark it wasn't actually wireshark but it was something else and i went to the point of actually looking up ips that i didn't recognize so that i could figure out whether or not they were making connections that i didn't really like uh, i used to chase them down through who is and anybody else that i could get my hands on to tell me details about them uh, i was that paranoid but I should have realized a long, long time ago that by using Linux, it's a lot more secure anyway. You don't necessarily put yourself in the line of fire in terms of your computer use if, for example, you were using Windows and you had no other option. But I took it to the absolute limit. I don't necessarily agree on the notion that um, just using Linux for your computer makes you more secure by default. Uh, I think you still got to... Um, got to use your head and looking at all the new shiny tools that come out front, like right, left, and center um, for the Linux ecosystem. More often than not, you see install instructions saying curl this URL pipe pseudo bash and there we go it's being like oh windows is so in, uh, so insecure and Linux is much more secure and we're doing stuff like that so <laughs> I, I challenge that assumption i tend to agree on average but i think with linux you've got much more of a, a choice to actually plug up the holes whereas in windows you've got no choice at all i mean there are ways that you can go about doing things to make windows more secure well if you do the curl to pipe to pseudo and that stuff it, you know it's at least your own fault in windows you know all this stuff gets done and you don't even know about it i also don't agree with that i mean it's certainly been that way up until windows vista and then everyone was joking about windows vista because it nagged you with all those um with all those confirmation uh, pop-ups um, but nowadays uh, i think 
as, as much as I would also prefer using Linux as my daily driver, I'm also a computer gamer and I can't be arsed to reboot my system all the time, which is why I'm using Windows in my personal life. And I, I will say as a long time Windows user, and I've been using Windows since 1993, since Windows 3.1, Windows 10 is pretty darn good, even compared to most Linux distributions. Um, if you consider the desktop usage and, and the average user as well. When you think about privacy, we don't tend to think about what our like individual threat model is. We don't tend to think about analyzing what particular kinds of threats we might face. Like it's unlikely that we're going to be targeted by a big nation state or organizations. Most of our privacy risks are different than that. And we tend to just kind of panic and think about what feels good from a privacy perspective rather than starting off from analyzing what our particular risks are and going from there. I have a um, difficult conversation because I do IT support for people that don't normally think about this, trying to make a distinction between security and privacy, actually. And they often get blurred into one. And I try and explain like Google, for example, the connection between your computer and Google is probably secure and private from other people than Google but it's not protecting your privacy from Google who then choose to share that with other people and use it in certain ways. And quite often the conversation starts to blur and they are linked, but they are also sort of distinct as well, I think. And quite often you end up talking about like vulnerabilities rather than privacy. And you can have an extremely secure system that doesn't protect your privacy at all. <laughs> I think Tom's argument still stands for that, um, because even if you are not talking about security per se, but about privacy, you still got to ask yourself, what's your threat model? What is the bad outcome that you fear from giving those companies your data? I mean, sure, they can target ads at you and um, make, make you more susceptible to uh, really good ones that you might actually follow through and buy something. But is it really a doomsday scenario that we fear that they sell out to governments or something? It is an intrusion into what you're doing, and, and I resent that kind of thing. Actually, a lot of people say, ah, yeah, but I like targeted ads. And it's not only that. I mean, they can do start doing illegal stuff, for example, targeting certain jobs and do racial segregation that's actually illegal in most of countries, and they do it anyway. And the second thing is they can start doing things that you don't like. For example, charge you more for your insurance because you are more at risk because they, we have all this data that shows you that. We've been subject to that from before the World Wide Web. Like credit card companies did this from day one. They, they know what you're buying and they can very well profile you just from a buying history. And we've come to accept that um, because of the convenience of credit cards. And the same thing, um, this example that you brought up is insurance companies. They've been doing the same kind of thing as well. And they're trying to get all the kinds of uh, statistics on you to, to profile you better and then give you a policy that, that works for you and i don't see how how the likes of google and facebook are different in the case of serving you targeted ads i think what is problematic but that's not a privacy issue is things like facebook which create um, giant echo chambers that are based on recommendation engines that are basically machine learning models that we collectively feed to serve us bullshit but that's not a privacy issue in a whole other conversation. Yeah, but it, it, it comes exactly to that because uh, when we talk about privacy, we talk of, about multiple aspects. If we talk about companies stocking your data and having an image of you and providing you with information that they think you want to read, and that starts with the Google results. That starts with the Facebook recommendations. You start a browser and you have all these cookies. So you have these plugins that allow you to delete cookies while continuing to browse and something. I think that's a good stuff because it is, I think, a good idea to try to limit the data that goes to these companies, even though you can not avoid it 100%. I can also simple things like deleting your history, your 
browser history, before you go to a site you see that could be targeting uh, my history or something, delete that history. It's just a shortcut. So we would we should try to think different about this collection of data. I don't know. I think there must be a better solution um, because I've been there, done that, um, doing like delicious or other like bookmarking kind of um, organization kind of stuff. But for like the better of the last 10 years, my browsing history has actually replaced my bookmarks and uh, Google search as well. I don't know about you guys, but I can't go back. <laughs> you don't need to delete your search history that's local. You need to delete your cookies, for example. I auto delete cookies every time I close a site. The cookies for that site get deleted every time I close Firefox. Every cookie I, that I had gets deleted. I need to log in again, but that's not a problem. It's just one click of, on a button and my password manager fills the rest. But it adds up. I mean, if, if you're using like half a dozen or a dozen or more different services all the time, that's uh, a dozen logins that you need to do every time. And you want to be secure, so you have 2FA enabled for them. So it's not just one click, but actually like two or three clicks because you need to copy the 2FA token or you maybe need to touch your YubiKey or something like that. That's like the other thing too. Like you need to invest time of your life to get back some of that privacy. And I'm just asking to what end are, are we are we doing this? Because the time that we invest is, is time that we don't get back either. Once it's actually established, then that becomes an automatic function of whatever browser you choose to use. But I don't understand how people can just give data over. I mean, the, the idea of uh, collecting statistics, and it was mentioned on a credit card system, for example, you've got to crunch that kind of data, but now we have the internet. It still needs to be crunched, but it's direct, and it's almost as if the entire network has been set up so that they can spy on the whole world's population. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Linode. Go to linode.com slash late night Linux to get started with $100 free credit and 60 days to use it. Linode offers cloud computing solutions in data centers all over the world. Whether it's scalable VMs with a choice of major distros or one-click apps and stacks, dedicated CPU and high RAM instances, block and object storage, or cloud firewalls and DDoS protection, Linode has everything you need for your personal projects right up to managed enterprise infrastructure. I recently moved our website over to Linode and it was really straightforward. And when I needed a mumble server for our community meetups, spinning up a new VM for that was an absolute breeze. Everything's been running flawlessly since I set it up, and I love the peace of mind I get from the automatic backups. So go to linode.com slash late night Linux, get your $100 credit, and check out Linode's great cloud hosting services and first class always available support. That's linode.com slash late night Linux. I'm just amazed that Lucifer talked about time he has to spend to secure his privacy. For me, it's not time that I spend, it becomes a routine. So I'm applying routines and applying these routines, I guess I spend less time. So I think it's not a good argument. You still do spend time that you could spend otherwise with your family, your kids, your hobbies, uh, whatever. Well, but, but we, we don't talk about hours. We talk about just applying routines while you're browsing the web applying routines while, as you said before, before doing a copy-paste of uh, a sudo command, maybe just read that command, read, if you understand it, verify that you read it from a site that you respect or somehow trust, like maybe GitHub. If you have a GitHub repository with installation instructions, and they apply any pseudo, pseudo commands, I would trust that. If I read that on a blog of a guy that I've never seen, and I don't know, I will not trust that. But if I read the same kind of thing of a website like OMG Ubuntu or something, I have tendency probably to trust these commands. Yeah, but why? Because I have in my life learned to trust somebody and to not trust somebody. And for me, a developer page like GitHub 
providing me the source code and, the ins and instructions to install it, I have tendency to trust that GitHub site. Otherwise, I guess the users will flag that site. And an official site like be it OMG Ubuntu yet just for YouTube, I think that they have a lot to lose if they start to publish things with code that is not trustworthy. But the same argument could be made for, for the likes of, of Google. They have also a lot to lose if they were to leak that data outside of what they're actually saying they're using it for. No, no, I don't agree with you. I don't believe it. But Google is a search engine and they know they cannot be reliable for the results they give. They can be reliable to safeguard the data that they collect about you. The problem is I don't like them for that, actually. I don't want them to know every where, where I am every time of my day without asking me. It's not a question of just passively collecting data. It's actually what you can extract from that data. That There's a lot of assumptions that you can make about lots and lots of different people by rearranging that data and asking different questions or processing it in different ways. And it gives away so much about human behavior that human behavior eventually becomes predictable inherently. And from that kind of behavior that you find on the internet, you can extract all kinds of information that's not directly relative to the activities that you're observing at the time. And that's what worries me. It's the extrapolation of extra data from all of that stuff. It's the assumptions you can make and the speculations that you can make. I got two good examples about that. Actually, there's one article, I will need to search it, but a woman, Facebook knew her sexual orientation and she hadn't told anyone, but Facebook knew, for example. And the second one is you can make assumption, for example, about the political affiliation. And that's really, really dangerous information to have, actually. For some people, yes. And those people should not use Facebook to begin with. That's kind of my point. Like stuff like Facebook, there is there is no debate. That's, that's, that's just cancer. There is no real massive net benefit of, of having Facebook at this point. Uh, maybe in the beginning, but not at this point anymore. Because it's just a huge like echo chamber uh, individualized for everyone. I agree with you. So I would never, never, never install Facebook on my phone. Never. But there might be a solution to use any convenience of Facebook on my desktop, using it in a browser with some security measures I take to save my privacy as good as I can. So I can profit from the benefits of Facebook without giving them all my data if I had it installed on my phone and Facebook would know wherever I am at every time. I think it's best just to leave social media alone completely, get off it. That's a choice that everyone needs to make for, for themselves, um, surely. But I think nowadays you're cutting yourself off um, from large parts of the society um, if you draw the, the line that hard. But coming back to what Google knows about you and the data uh, and the information that you can infer from all the profiles that Google and Facebook and, and the rest of it make of us, I'm not as much worried about Google as I am worried about, um, say, our government institutions, our insurances, our internal revenue services, our uh, pension funds, our health insurances, all these kinds of institutions who are way more protected from public scrutiny because if a company fucks up majorly, they're going to lose their customers and people will go elsewhere. People will be fine with Bing if Google came out and had a huge data leak where um, all the user profiles or even a large part of the user profiles um, leaked into the public. Whereas if your health insurance fucks up their IT security, well, they're not going to go away. They're probably not even going to get a fine. They, they're going to issue a press statement and they just going to chuck along. And what are, uh, what are you going to do? Uh, you've got to go to, uh, to another health insurance, but um, depending on the system, you're in they are not private entities but public entities um, so they're completely safe from scrutiny even more so with internal revenue services who know all about your finances and i don't know about the the uk um for example uh but last time i was in london there was like security cameras everywhere 
and the feeds from those cameras get fed into um, government system uh, and the systems are operated by people who are not IT experts, who are not like cloud native companies, um, people who like 20 years ago would have known to operate a VCR and now they get some shady cloud service that uh, was the cheapest bidder on, on the public contract to save that data. And our governments and public institutions, they as well collect huge chunks of data about us, uh, which they could infer um, lots of other information from. And I don't trust them one inch that they are able to actually do this securely in the long run. Whereas I do with Google, because at least from a technical point of view, they know the fuck what they're doing. Okay, this episode is sponsored by CBT Nuggets, training for IT professionals or anyone looking to build IT skills. Go to cbtnuggets.com slash late night Linux and sign up for a seven day free trial. The on-demand virtual labs mean you can build practical experience with the commands, config, scripts, and everything you need to get the most out of each course. Another standout feature is the accountability coaching service available to all learners with a subscription, which gives you access to a real person who will help you craft a personalized learning plan and set goals, and will check in with you to keep you accountable. So start your free seven-day trial today at cbtnuggets.com slash late night Linux. It includes unlimited access to all course materials, including virtual labs. That's cbtnuggets.com slash late night Linux. There may be um, one answer to this question. It might be an overarching solution to the problem we're going to have to see. Uh, but in the next few years, when we get a quantum internet and we've got personalized quantum computers that might actually provide the solution to the problem because that kind of encryption is tagged to be completely unbreakable. So if you're communicating directly with a particular source or you're sending information in a particular direction and there's no third party to intercept it, and it, it proves to be a reliable and unbreakable way of encrypting stuff. But we have that right now. We have that right now, but it won't filter down to us for quite a long time. That's the thing we have. We have that right now. If you, that's what uh, I think. What what someone said before: if you go to Google Mail with your browser, your connection is end-to-end -end encrypted between between you and the Google server. If I talk to you on um, on Telegram and I open a private chat or on Signal um, or any other of those messengers which support end-to-end -end encryption, our communication is secure. But that doesn't stop people from tracking you all over the internet um, when when you're browsing the web. So that that's that's a different thing. I don't think that this will solve this issue of uh, privacy. It really worries me what how much the government knows. But the problem is you're giving Google and other companies too much credit. I mean, Google leaked half a million accounts in 2018. How many people stopped using Google? Not many. And Facebook leaked 500 million accounts <laughs> and a lot of people are, are, are still using WhatsApp and Instagram and Facebook. I mean, they're using it because it's convenient, aren't they? Because I think any time you try and increase your privacy, you're necessarily making your life more inconvenient in some way. And the problem with privacy is that the benefits are quite intangible. And for most people, the benefits of giving your data to someone feels like you're not giving up something because it is just the default and you're getting loads of benefits. You can talk with friends that you might not be able to see in some sense, all these kind of things that the big tech companies provide based on us giving up some element of our privacy. We do have end-to-end -end encryption, which is what Lux was talking about, but it's not quantum encrypted. If anybody here is unfamiliar with quantum encryption, uh, look it up and read about it because the variability there is so fantastically large that you can't find a way of decoding a piece of information that is transmitted from A to B. It's still in its infancy and it hasn't yet been implemented, but they're experimenting with it. And once it does actually filter down to ordinary users like us, then it might actually provide a solution to this problem. But you only have to compromise the end device, do you not? Like if it's end-to-end -end encryption, you don't need to really compromise the encryption when you can just compromise the device at either end. 
Exactly. And that's, that's coming back to Tom's argument. What's, what's your threat model? Like if you're um, defending against script kitties or your, your, your shotgun malware distributor, the end-to-end -end encryption that we have today is fine. If you're defending against a state level actor, you've lost period. There's nothing you can do about it. Even if you have like quantum end-to-end -end encryption between your device and device, uh, the other device um, uh, of, of the people you're talking with, it's so easy for a state level actor to compromise you in so many other ways. And there is, there is not much in between that's really relevant today. I mean, most of us in here, I would suppose, are in, in a very good position when, when it comes to that. There are people in, in countries um, who have to fear for their lives if, if it came out that they that they're homosexual for example like i think in in iran um there is there is corporal punishment for that still but if you are i hate to say this but if you are a middle-aged white man in a western country you don't have much drawbacks from being profiled like that and as you said you get all the benefits and all the convenience out of that <laughs>